Welcome to Tech Data's 30 Minutes with a Hacker. Thanks everyone for joining this next episode of 30 Minutes with a Hacker. My name is Jade Witte with Tech Data Security Solutions Group. And with me here today is Brett Scott and Alex Riles. You've heard Brett many times over the course of the last two years when we've been doing these episodes, but I also have Alex Riles. I'll let you both introduce yourselves briefly before we kick this off. Thanks, Jade. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is Alex Riles. I'm the global VP of our security solution team here at Tech Data, and I'm really excited to be talking about Zero Trust with you guys today. And I'm Brett Scott. I've been here uh, every week for the last two years. I'm a director level here, and I oversee the Tech Data Cyber Reach. Today's topic, as Alex mentioned, is around Zero Trust. We're going to talk about what it is, kind of defining it and understanding it, why it's important, and we're going to get into some practical steps on how you can implement it. So Brett, I think a good way to start this off, or Alex, maybe it's better for you, does talk about uh, what zero trust is, kind of define it for us. Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding out there in the market based on the architecture from a lot of the vendors in the community. Um, zero trust is not really a product in and of itself. I, I like to think of it as more of a philosophy of how to deploy your network environment. It's a concept that brings with it a lot of different types of technologies. And I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later on, but it, it's the idea of us evolving our thinking from used to whenever we would build nice network perimeters around our companies. And as long as you have a good solid firewall, you keep the bad guys out, evolving to a thought that you have to protect everything inside the network in the same way you protect it outside. We can no longer trust that just because you came inside that you're gonna be doing um, things that are acceptable to the organization. We wanna control where you can go, how you can go there, and we wanna authenticate and authorize every user, but also every device that interacts with us in every way. The, the design principle, I guess, if you think about zero trust architectures is um, trust but verify. Right? I'm going to trust, but I'm going to first verify every single time that you are who you say you are and that you're allowed to be where you say you want to be. And that way we're also evolving our thinking to this other philosophy, which is the bad guy is likely already in your network. So what are you going to do about it now? So knowing that he's already there, is it a wide open door? So once he's inside, he can go in any room of your house or is every room of your house have a lock on it? And the bad guy might be able to get into your living room, but he can't get to your bedroom. He can't get to your kitchen because there's a door in every room. Like that's kind of the high level philosophy of zero trust. Great. Brett, do you have anything to add to that? You know, the uh, that's a very good explanation, Alex. So I really appreciate that. The uh, It is absolutely a way of doing things for people who have been doing this for a long time. You might remember defense in depth which is a really great strategy. Think of uh, zero trust as a really awesome evolution and addition to the idea of defense in depth. So it is something that does not have to be done all at once, but it is something you must begin pursuing because we're just in a different world. We've seen through supply chain attacks and other related uh, problems recently that the bad guys are not having an awful lot of trouble getting into your network. They might even be there now considering the fact that most companies can't detect that a breach has occurred for over 200 days on average. Think about that. I mean, if you were, if you walked into your kitchen one morning and you see someone there, you're like, what are you doing in my house? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm getting mail here. I've been here for over 200 days. Um, that's exactly the kind of problem we all have on our networks. So you're going to need to approach your workplace from a standpoint of there may be people here that are not supposed to be on my network. I need to find them and I need to get them off my network. And then the defense in depth, evolution of zero trust says, here's what I can do to prevent whoever is bad here from getting to other places on my network that I don't want them to go. So you don't have to do it all at once. It is a concept. There are many different technologies involved, but you absolutely need to get started for sure. So we have a really, uh, you know, real world example of something that's impacting all of us right now, uh, mainly on the East Coast with the colonial pipeline breach that's happened. And Zero Trust plays into this. Brett, I'd love for you just to kind of talk about uh, what's happened with that breach. I know you're privy to some intel that 
maybe not everyone does and there's certain things you can and can't share, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that and uh, from your perspective. Yeah, it's a very great example, uh, a very recent one, but keep in mind that then the, the noise of all that is masking many other breaches that have been going on, other ransomware things as well. But let's get right back down to Colonial, right? So Colonial is a pipeline operator and they've got an office, they have an operations team that has IT, and then they have their pipeline. And so the uh, problem that they had occurred in the world of their operations team. These are people who are directly responsible for the management of that pipeline and their systems got ransomware. Uh, so Colonial made the call and they paid the ransom very, very quickly. However, uh, the ability to recover was very slow for them. And so they elected to shut down the pipeline as a preventative measure because most OT, uh, like the pipeline itself, isn't easily recoverable. You can't necessarily restore from backup. So if you lose it, you lose it, right? So uh, they, they made the call and it had a tremendous amount of disruption to our country. But keeping in mind that the very, the very problem that they are trying to address would have easily been resolved by ha them having used a zero trust methodology, right? The ability to containerize or isolate through micro segmentation would have prevented their fear of what if this leaks into our OT network on our pipelines, that would have been easy because it wouldn't have been able to do that. It would have been micro segmented. So that is a, an easy example of how they could have saved quite literally millions of dollars of loss. And that's, it's millions of dollars for the, the money that they paid don't forget that there will be fines, there will be all of these other costs associated with this. So it gets to be real easy to understand how a simple amount of investment before this problem occurred would have prevented them from losing the millions of dollars that they're losing right now. Interesting thought there I'll throw in, Jay. When it comes to the Colonial Pipeline, what's interesting is there's, as, as Brett mentioned, there's the IT component of that with their computer systems and their IT staff who are managing um, all the systems and data that control that pipeline. But at the end of the day, there's a conversion from the IT to, as Brett mentioned, the OT, the operational technology side that handles the physical aspect of the pipeline. And all along that pipeline, there are uh, physical valves and things that can be turned on and off all through electrical pulses, through servos, through what we call a SCADA network. And a SCADA network is that, that translation almost of an IP network into physical things that can be maneuvered. And the, the challenge with our infrastructure in this country today, and this is a great example of pipelines, but this applies to a lot of different, you know, water systems and sewer systems. It's, it's that our SCADA networks are largely flat networks. In other words, if I break into a little um, shack on the side of the pipeline in some city in the middle of nowhere, and it has SCADA controls in it, and I can hack into the network there, I could in theory likely control any part of the SCADA network because it's flat network, it's not micro segmented. And uh, once you're in, you're kind of in. Now it's possible to do micro segmentation of SCADA, but most of our national infrastructure has not implemented that yet. That's what makes this so, so scary. Uh, we don't yet have all the details of exactly what was compromised in Colonial Pipeline. I'm sure that will be released over time. But I can imagine that even if not this scenario, in another scenario, um, we, we need to do more to secure our SCADA networks with zero trust as well. Because zero trust is more than just authenticating people. It's equally about authenticating devices. Uh, your laptop connecting to your corporate network, it's not enough just to say that you as a person like Brett logging in is authorized. What about Brett's device? Because what if I'm imitating Brett, pretending to be him, connecting in from a device the network doesn't recognize, they should deny me, right? In which case me as an imposter wouldn't be able to connect to that network. And our SCADA networks work the same way. We need to be authorizing devices that connect to that network, knowing that they're on a whitelist um, and, and an authorized device. And if not, they ought to not be able to transact any sort of a signal on that network. So. We have a long way to go just to secure our national infrastructure. And this was a great example of how vulnerable we can be. It's pretty scary. And, you know, it also talks to the fact that each of us has a role in uh, our mutual safety and defense, right? So 
Uh, if you're on the East Coast, you are have a very vivid example of the impacts of Colonial's poor cybersecurity practices, right? The gas pumps either don't have gas or they're ridiculously expensive. People have been getting into physical altercations. Um, there's a great deal of disruption that has occurred. And uh, if you're a business, you've had to account for this and your, your costs have dramatically increased as a direct result of, again, a company that you've never heard of, probably Colonial, being bad at cybersecurity. So it goes to the whole, you know, we are we are as strong as our weakest link. Don't be the weakest link, right? And so, everything that every company does and every organization does has a ripple effect when they are either good or bad in cybersecurity. Uh, so we need to get more positive ripples going than there are negative ripples out there. So Brett, the interesting what you just said there. So what are some technologies that could have been implemented that uh, could have prevented that attack or some other attacks? Number one, you have to know who is who and what is what, right? So that's identity. You, all cybersecurity generally hinges on that one concept. What, who, who is this person? What is this device? So you're gonna start by having a really good identity and access management system. I would say the next highest priority investment is to know what's going on on your network and tools that can be used to do that are things like SIEM tools, security incident and event management tools. They bring all of the logs from all the little devices on your network and they bring them together and correlate that data to let you know what's going on. And that's a tool that not only improves your cybersecurity, but it also is the foundation on which you can build things like orchestration and other things that are going to help you to manage all of the stuff that you're going to be doing in a zero trust architecture. So those are two things you can do right away. Yeah, that's a good, I've got a couple more I can think of. Um, so the, the topic here is what, what is really zero trust? Um, because it's not a product as we talked about, it's a methodology for how to secure your network. So it is obviously composed of lots of different potential technologies from many different vendors who, who are involved in, in these things. So when Brett mentions identity and access management, that's such an important part of the equation to authenticate not only the user, but also the device. And there's parts of identity and access management I think that are important. For instance, multi-factor authentication is is incredibly important. Pa we need to, as a society, migrate to passwordless authentication because passwords are probably the most vulnerable part of our networks today because people choose simple passwords. They're easy to crack and, uh, and that makes our systems and ourselves vulnerable. So multi-factor authentication with passwordless technologies like mobile apps uh, that you might get a text to or a push notification where you approve a login, um, that's important. Another identity and access topic that's a, an important part of Zero Trust, I think, is what we call privileged access management. So this is the idea that used to, you would have an administrator or a on a Windows box or a, a root level user on a Linux box that would just log in as root or administrator and have access to everything on your network. Well, if you had 10 different administrators in your company, how do you know which one of those 10 people was actually doing something potentially nefarious? And the answer is with privileged access management, we can now make sure that every individual user, Jade and Brett and Alex are all administrators, but we're actually logging in as our own user IDs, not as administrator or root. Therefore, if Brett were to go rogue, which I could totally see happening, um, we would know it was Brett and not me, for instance, because I'm a, I'm a great guy. I would never do something like that. This is where I spend all of my time stealing Alex's passwords. <laughs> so privileged access management is a really important part of the equation. And another one is um, encryption. So it, it's important that if you think a bad guy's already in your network, wouldn't you want your data to be encrypted even within your network as in addition to outside the network? This is where uh, SD-WAN comes into play as you talk about connecting branch office spaces. You want all that data encrypted so that someone can't just put a sniffer on your network and listen to the traffic and understand what's happening there. there I'm sure there's several others. Brett, can you think of other technologies that would be included in a zero trust architecture model? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you've got, you brought up a, a lot of the really high value investments that people can make. You know, multi-factor authentication allows an organization to defend itself because 
for example, uh, uh, to use a wedding metaphor, it's something you know and then something you have, right? So I know the password, but I need to have my mobile phone so that I can do the secondary authentication. And because of that, if the bad guys do break in, they do capture Alex's password, as we all know is very easy to do, then we still have the problem of having to capture Alex's phone before we can log in as Alex, which is my current dilemma. I mean, I can help you with that, Brett. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. But so the, the second part of this, of course, is um, what, how do you, how do you know what you know, right? And that's where things like analytics and orchestration can come in, right? So uh, if, for example, if you're using analytics, then you might know that Alex doesn't generally log in from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. in the on our networks. And he's certainly not doing accounting transactions during that time period. And he's probably not in Russia at the moment. So if you are able to use analytics, you can say, well, that's Alex's password. And it looks like Alex, all right. Maybe even it looks like his device, but he doesn't do this at this time. So we're going to deny him access to this thing because it's out of his norm. If you don't know what normal is, you have no ability to do that. And if you're trying to do it based on a hunch, you have a human being that's never going to be successful. So orchestration is, is something that can be connected with your analytics, with your SIM and things like that to where you can see and then you can react and do things. So for example, Alex is trying to log into our accounting system at three o'clock in the morning from China. That's a bad idea. We're not going to let that happen. I'm going to proactively stop that from occurring. In fact, I'm going to temporarily disable his account because I think his account might be compromised. That's something that humans don't do well, but that is something that technology does very well. But technology cannot do that for you unless you know what you know. Know Alex, know his devices, have heuristic or, uh, or analytical data that you can use to say this is, is normal or is not normal, and then have an orchestration system that allows automation to take place to prevent some of these problems. Imagine how much more secure your organization would be with just those components uh, assisting you. And you don't have to hire someone for these things. You need to hire the right people to help you assemble the technologies so that you end up with this net beneficial result. And another, another one I can think of is cloud access security brokers. So a CASB solution is another important part of a zero trust architecture. It's the idea of controlling the access for employees into our cloud workloads, whether that's Office 365 or a Workday for your HR system or a Salesforce.com for your sales automation, whatever that cloud-based system is, putting a cloud access security broker in front of it authenticates the user not only for workloads in your you know in your local network as we've been talking about but your cloud workloads as well you want to make sure that uh, the right person has access to Am your amazon instance as an example we read so often about how much data is stolen from an amazon s3 storage bucket not that amazon isn't secure but people forget that amazon is just a network resource and it has to be secured in the same way you would secure an on-premise resource and so cloud access security broker is a technology that can help you secure and lock down your cloud workloads so that they're micro segmented in the same way your on-premise items are. Another important uh, technology I think is part of zero trust is good endpoint detection and response technology. So whether this is VMware, Carbon Black, or a McAfee solution, or a sem Broadcom semantic solution, this kind of an offering is going to um, be able to protect your endpoint device and even in some cases be used to authenticate your device to your access management system so that he's saying, I'm watching this device. This is really Brett and his device. Uh, and EDR solution can absolutely help with that and, and even help with mitigating against an attack like ransomware. So many of the EDR solutions can capture the sign of ransomware on a device. In other words, starting to encrypt large number of files very quickly and shut that process down before it infects the entire endpoint. So I think EDR is also a really important part of detecting the problem and responding to it immediately um, so that we don't ha we can trust our devices in a zero trust architecture. Well, two great points. And most organizations are integrating cloud. So they're essentially what is being deemed a hybrid environment. There's stuff that's inside their networks and then there's stuff that they're using outside their networks. So whether it be uh, just a simple hybrid 
or if you're attempting a SASE type solution, SASE uh, is where SASE is. All of those things require you to, again, have things that are protecting the devices inside, but also to be able to understand what's going on and should it be happening through the outside hybrid networks as well. So all of these things work together and uh, one might begin to say, well, gosh, there's an awful lot of stuff here. I don't know where to get started. Keep it simple, right? You know, there are some basics, you know, scroll back to the beginning of this where we talked about here are some things you can do right now to put down the footprint to get started. But what we're showing you is that there's an easy, linear, predictable and budgetable uh, progression to get you into a better cybersecurity posture. And every single one of the things that's been mentioned so far is going to improve your fundamental cybersecurity and it's going to prevent you from becoming the next colonial uh, and, and, and fusing millions of dollars to, uh, you know, hostile, hostile actors probably outside the country. Yeah, another thought there. And you bring up a great point, Brett. There's a lot here involved with Zero Trust. You could spend millions of dollars implementing lots of things, but there needs to be an order to it, a priority in a way. And here's the way I would challenge our audience to think about prioritizing Zero Trust architecture deployment. At the end of the day, it all comes down to our data. We as a company have data that we want to protect. Sometimes we have data we want to share, but at the end of the day, data is king. And Data lives in our networks, in the cloud and on premise. So I would challenge us to think about, identify the data that you need to protect the most. Where is it in your network? Uh, where is it in the cloud? What is your requirement for availability of that data? And from that, you can map out, how does that data traverse throughout your network? Because that tells you who should have access to those network paths and how, what level of protection you should probably put on them. I would center your whole strategy there around the data and how it interacts with all your systems and then design zero trust on that data flow um, to your business applications, to um, your users. Some data is gonna be sensitive, some's not. You're not gonna wanna protect all data in the same way and that's okay. But doing that data inventory, I think is a super good way to kind of prioritize your zero trust architecture because whenever you deploy identity and access management to the entire network, you probably want to put a little more focus to the areas of the network that have the critical sale, you know, sales out data and, and that sort of thing. So um, the, the, the other thing I would suggest is that you monitor that information, that data as it flows throughout your networks using network monitoring tools, encrypt the data as we already talked about. But I think data, if that's your central theme of your approach, that can really provide a lot of um, information around how you would go about deploying zero trust. It absolutely helps you prioritize where you make your investment. And on that front, the investment doesn't have to be large. You don't have to buy the greatest, biggest, glowest, and shiniest thing. There are lots of different ways for you to implement this. So think of it as there are solutions out there for small business, and there are obviously solutions there for the biggest businesses that are out there which ones you use is based on good advisory and good people who are going to help direct you and guide you to the right solutions. So it is something for everyone and everyone benefits regardless of what you're protecting, um, whether it's big or small. Um, you know, a lot of people say, oh gosh, you know, we don't make military equipment. That's why we don't invest in these security technologies. Well, Colonial doesn't uh, invest in military stuff. They don't make jet fighters they pipe gas from one state to another state. And because of that, they became strategic to an, a, an, another's military interests. And because of that, they became a high priority target. So everyone is either a target or they're on the way to a target. So regardless of who you are, and as part of that whole ecosystem concept, don't be the weak link because why would you need to be the one that needs to make Colonial vulnerable, for example, or vice versa? Uh, if you can do your part, we can all be a lot safer. And because of that, it gets easier. So if you're feeling overwhelmed by cybersecurity, if you're feeling like you just can't keep up, well, it starts with a simple choice. Today, it's not going to be me. It's not going to be my company. We're going to do something about that. And as a direct result, if more people make that decision every day, all of our cybersecurity gets easier and overall less costly. It comes down to trust but verify, right? At the end of the day, we want to trust people, but we always have to verify who they are, why they're there, where they're asking to go in order to keep our yeah. network safe. Alex, is there any um, any way you could weave in the, the cyber range and how that could be leveraged? And I know a lot of people know that tech data has invested in a cyber range. Not everyone probably. 
maybe you could touch on that. Yeah, I, I think that's a great topic because we've we've talked about a lot here, but we haven't even scratched the surface on all that zero trust could mean in your organization. Like we haven't talked about email and how we should not be trusting our own employees to click the right links and emails, right? There's a whole this great discussion around that. There's so many great topics there. And so our cyber range facility is virtual and physical. It's physical in that it's located in Phoenix, Arizona. We're not open physically at the moment, but we for the last year now have had a great virtual model where we provide a lot of training opportunities and we do events with people to educate them on topics like defense in depth, as Brett mentioned earlier, zero trust technologies. We love to have these kind of discussions around what is the best way to deploy zero trust, we demonstrate what Zero Trust looks like in a practical sense, showing multi-vendor kind of demonstrations of what would it look like to have an EDR solution from a vendor like a Carbon Black integrating into a SIM solution like IBM Q Radar, where we could show um, giving visibility and information to an IT team to know when something nefarious is happening so that you can shut it down as quickly as possible, hopefully with orchestration. So not only do we provide an environment through our cyber range to educate and learn about these topics, but also an opportunity to see it in action. I think there's a lot of value in that for our partner community as they're designing solutions for their customers. And, and if uh, we, we love to have these kinds of discussions we're having today with our partners is they're wrestling with what is the right way to protect customer A in their use case with their technologies. It's a, it's a lot of fun. And I think our cyber range team just loves to have those discussions. Great point, Alex. So, you know, you mentioned partner and maybe some of the people that are listening to this don't know what we mean by partner. So tech data is a distributor or a fortune 100 company. Maybe just touch a little bit on that. Uh, sure. So tech data has a special role in the ecosystem. We're a distributor, which means we buy technology from the ISVs who make stuff and we turn around and sell it to what we call the channel partner community who are resellers and system integrators and service providers who then deliver services and products to end user customers like banks and hospitals and retail stores, et cetera. So we don't sell direct to the end user, but our role is to make sure that the thousands of partners out in the community um, that are selling technology to end user customers are enabled and trained and knowledgeable in security. In our particular case, uh, Brett and I work in the security business for tech data. We're distributing security technology for many of the common vendors that you might be familiar with, like Checkpoint and Cisco and IBM and um, and I, VMware Carbon Black and many, many others. So we want to enable and train the partner community, but also provide them resources to educate and train the end user community as well. And it's a real privilege. And our cyber range, as we mentioned earlier, is one of those resources that we use not only to reach the, the partners that we're enabling to sell technology, but also to reach their customers who need training and enablement and knowledge around how to secure their networks. All right, well, with that, we'll wrap this up and appreciate both Alex and Brett for, for being on here and sharing your, your insights and wisdom. And Alex, will have you on a lot more this was really great having you participate on this podcast. So I look forward to everyone joining next month's podcast on 30 Minutes with a Hacker. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.